The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. A so-called black caucus in American legislatures has been around for decades. But for more than 150 years, Ontario's Legislative Assembly did not have one. It does now. And two years on, we're checking in with members of that caucus and two trailblazers that helped pave their way. First, in an unprecedented move last week, Laurentian University in Sudbury used the creditor protection process to eliminate myriad programs and staff. Nan Kiwanuka finds out what it means to all of Northern Ontario and beyond. It's Monday, April 19th, and that's ahead on The Agenda. In February, Laurentian University in Sudbury made a stunning announcement. Due to what they described as unprecedented financial challenges, the school applied for creditor protection. Last week, the tangible results of that became clear as deep cuts to programs and staff were made public. With us now for more in Sudbury, Nadia Varelli, Professor of Political Science at Laurentian University. In North Hi. Bay, Gillian Phillips, professor of Nipissing University and past president of the Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Associations. And here in the provincial capital, Sebastian Lalonde, chair of the Canadian Federation of Students Ontario. Hi to everyone. Uh, it's very nice to meet you. Hi. Thanks for being on the show. Hi, thank you. Hi. Uh, before we start, in the interest of full disclosure, we just wanted to let you know uh, Steve isn't doing this interview tonight because for the past eight years, he's been the Chancellor of Laurentian University. The Chancellorship is a ceremonial position. He presided over convocations and special events. So, given the current situation at Laurentian, he decided to step down as Chancellor a week ago. Just thought you all should all know that, and just to put that on uh, the public record, so to speak. Um, so, as of last week, more than 100 faculty members were laid off and more than 60 programs were eliminated. I wanted to get an idea from the three of you um, on your reactions to this. And as is our tradition, we usually start from the furthest to the closest. So, uh, Nadia, I'll start with you. Hi. Uh, well, as you mentioned, um, on April 12, um, over 100 of us were laid off. And I believe it's 40 support staff were also laid off. And then we found out that 69 programs were cancelled, 50 of which were undergrad, 11 grad programs. Of the programs, the undergrad programs, 24 were French language programs and the other were English language programs. That is shocking. Uh, Gillian, what was your um, reaction to that news? Well, devastating, of course. Um, and I, you know, I just have to say that all of this could have been avoided oh. if Minister Romano, well, if Minister Romano and the Ford government had stepped in. And honestly, we are putting Minister Romano right at the center of responsibility for the program cuts, for the job losses, and for the devastation to the community of Sudbury. Um, the, the failure of this government to step in and support Laurentian is, uh, is, is really a, a failure to support education in the North. And Minister Romano, he's, um, Ross Romano is the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. He's also an MPP for Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, Sebastian, what is your reaction? I think it was quite similar, right? Quite devastating, quite shocking. However, we are also aware that there was some financial issues happening at Laurentian University uh, for months now. And so I very much echo the fact that it's the responsibility of the minister and the Ministry of uh, Colleges and Universities to step in to make sure that our institutions are properly funded. And they failed in that and instead allowed this institution, a publicly funded institution, to depend on a process that is usually reserved for corporate entities, uh, because, uh, which is disgusting. Uh, well, because Minister uh, Romano is not here to maybe um, defend his position, uh, Laurent, the, you know, we have been hearing that this, pro this problem didn't just happen this year. It's something that's been in the making for a while. Uh, the university itself, Laurentian, cites debt, a tuition reduction and freeze, and of course the pandemic um, as partially to blame. Uh, Gillian, um, what does their situation uh, mean for the way Ontario universities are funded moving forward? 
Well, their situation is complex and it has a long-term cause and a short-term cause. The long-term cause is uh, year after year for over a decade of, of underfunding of Ontario universities. Um, and, and, and that has caused a many, pushed many universities into seeking other forms of revenue and into uh, financially precarious decision-making. Like what? But Can you give us an example of that? Um, well, the I think one of the one of the um, uh, issues that that may come up uh, later is is the over reliance on international students to make up the the loss of revenue. Um, but also, we have uh, the consequences uh, for universities and for education. We have the lowest per student funding in Canada, in Ontario. We have the highest faculty to student ratio, so our classes are biggest. Um, and we have an, a, a very profound uh, and increasing over-reliance on contract faculty to do the teaching at universities. So over 50% of our courses in Ontario are taught by folks who are um, employed on um, low wage, uh, temporary contracts, often with little benefits and no job security, and don't take an active or not paid to take take an active role in um, university governance or, or supported to do research. Um, and all of this is just uh, eroding the academic quality of all our institutions. But I do think the Northern institutions are especially vulnerable to all of these factors. And for Laurentian, um, add to that the 10% tuition cut, um, the incredibly reckless funding model, which puts 60% brought in by the Ford government, which puts 60% of government funding at universities at risk, $3 billion, uh, and then dump the, the COVID pandemic on top of that. And um, it's not surprising that a university would be suffering. However, um, I take the point of uh, the, the other guest as well, that there is clearly some mismanagement at the, at the university itself. However, we don't know what that was because the entire university finances have been cloaked in secrecy. And, and so has this whole creditor protection proceedings been cloaked in secrecy. So we don't have the answers to how they got there, you know, right now. Sebastian, I'll bring you in because I think that was your point that you made, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly that, right? There's a lack of consultation with the community, a lack of discussion in terms of what can actually save students' degrees, assure that jobs are safe, and that there's a continuation of investment in Northern education in Ontario as a whole. Um, and unfortunately, that's, that's not what we're seeing. And in fact, we're seeing a government, which is essentially apathetic to these very severe cuts and what this is going to mean for the entire community, the student staff and the faculty. Nadia, I want to bring you in. I don't want to put you on the spot because um, I don't want to shoulder it on you, but I'm curious to know, is there a why we think this is happening to Laurentian? Why the major restructuring or why the CC double well, Because from what Gillian was saying, it sounds as if the university was already being treated um, unfairly, so to speak. Well, I, I think she raises good points. They're all points that uh, we're facing as small universities. The 10% uh, wage reduction, the tuition freeze, the reduced funding has led smaller universities in small towns to face financial challenges um, unforeseen. And this is years of underfunding. With regards to the CCAA process and the restructuring, I echo uh, the other guests. Yes, has there been mismanagement at Laurentian? From my understanding, there has been, if anyone reads the court papers, where exactly is not entirely sure. Um, did Laurentian need to be structured? Of course it did. Any university faces restructuring from time to time. But we have a process in place, as does every university, to restructure academic programs. And the CCAA is not the way to restructure programs. And if you look at the list of programs that were cut, it's evident that there was no real consideration in, in the types of programs that we're offering or how these programs service the community, provided pathways to immigration, pathways to uh, the job market. Rather, from my understanding or from what I'm surmising with the cuts, it came down to which programs were profitable. And public education, secondary education, or post-secondary education is not just about making money. It's about building networks, uh, building networks for the community, of the community. It's about providing 
students with opportunities they wouldn't otherwise have. It's about working with the community. I want to get more into that in a little bit, um, but because right now the provincial government hasn't stepped in. And Nadia, I wanted to get your sense. Should the federal government step in? The federal government? Uh, of course. Uh, I perfectly understand that education is a provincial jurisdiction. However, we all know that the federal government, through its federal transfer power, uh, through uh, transfer to social programs, does provide funding for education. And yes, the and I know this is coming up later, but Laurentian has the unique mandate of triculturalism and bilingualism. These are core values of Canada. You know, our federal government is committed to bilingualism. Our federal government is committed to reconciliation. And this is what Laurentian is doing at the university. So I did expect, I did hope that they would step in. And yes, they needed, they need to step in. Uh, in February, Alex Asher of Higher Education Strategies Association spoke to me about Laurentian's approach to international students. Uh, let's watch the clip. Sheldon, please roll. And I think the other thing to remember is, is they've chosen not to go after international students. Most universities in Ontario have brought in a lot of international students over the last six, seven years. Um, and, you know, I think if, if Laurentian had done the same at the same kind of rate as other institutions in the province, they'd have had an extra $8 million a year, um, that, you know, in, in 2018, 19, 2019, 2020. And that would have caused this whole problem to go away. Uh, so are there enrollment problems? Yeah, but I think they're of Laurentian zone making. It's not something that's happening to them because of demographics. I mean, right now, because of the pandemic, you know, having international students might be one of a series of strategies. Uh, but Sebastian, I just wanted to ask you, you know, how important is a program like that uh, to a university like Laurentian? Yeah, I have to be honest that this discussion uh, oftentimes I think derails where the focus really should be. Uh, it's rather disingenuous to say that we need to depend on international students to support our post-secondary education system. So far in Ontario, about 20% of it is funded by inter international student differential fees who are paying two, three, sometimes four times the amount of domestic students and who also, by the way, during a pandemic, don't even have access to the basic Ontario health insurance plan and are forced into private insurance companies. This province has a long history of using international students as cash cows to support its post-secondary education system when the provincial government has the capacity and yet lack of will to see education as a public good and to fund it directly because we know that it is better for society as a whole, that we know that a dollar invested in post-secondary education comes back to a dollar 36 in the overall province. And so when talking about international students and the practices that we've already put uh, our institutions in, in terms of having to poach those students, in terms of having to find corporate deals um, and get financing elsewhere from the provincial government, is an attack on our uh, institution's quality of education, but then also uh, ethically, it's, it's just not morally sound. And so to have this argument and to put the focus away from the provincial government's responsibility um, it is a gross practice, and this differential fees for international students has to end. Um, Nadia mentioned this before about uh, the tricultural mandate at Laurentian, and I think it is something that the school prides it's itself for. Um, it offers English, French, and Indigenous programs. Sebastian, you know, uh, French programs have been hit hard. What's at stake for Francophone students in the North? Yeah, for sure. You know, I personally, so I'm Franco-Ontarian. It was my first language. And when I chose to go to uh, post-secondary education, I went to a York University and did my program entirely in English. And that's because the programs that I was looking to do to complete my entire education in French isn't available or is at least very, very um stark in, in the province of Ontario. Laurentian University was one of the few places where you could get a fully uh, francophone post-secondary education. And yet, as we've seen, that and Indigenous studies and Indigenous language programs are the very first things to be cut when we're seeing financial cutbacks. Uh, and, and that is a direct attack on the francophone community, on the Indigenous communities, and especially for such a tricultural, not only university, but a tricultural community in Sudbury.
Um, they, I know Alex Asher, even when he was on the show in February, said there has been a lack of communication by the president of Laurentian, uh, President Robert Hache, released uh, a statement. And I'm just going to read a little bit of the statement. And Gillian, I wanted to get your reaction. Um, so uh, he writes, while we understand that the termination of the Laurentian Federation has left some students with questions regarding their academic path, solutions are being worked on. For example, Laurentian University will provide approximately 140 students registered in the Indigenous Studies program at the University of Sudbury with access to courses rooted in Indigenous perspectives already on offer, mostly through Laurentian's Faculty of Arts in a range of disciplines. As part of our commitment to honor and affirm our tricultural mandate, Laurentian is committed to an Indigenous perspectives program among its academic offerings, in addition to its well-established Bachelor of Indigenous Social Work and Master of Indigenous Relations programs. Uh, first question, Gillian, um, what is the Laurentian Federation? Well, the, um, the, 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 the universities that are um, connected through this, these federation agreements with, um, uh, with Laurentian have grown up through a, um, you know, kind of independent um, and, and in some case faith-based faith processes. And they have um, agreement, legal agreements and, uh, and, and, and longstanding, um, you know, arrangements between the students and, and Laurentian University and the, and the, um, and the federations. Uh, and, and what's shocking is that Hache would come in and just cancel these agreements unilaterally um, and and in the middle of the creditor protection process, with no academic consultation or consideration from what that might mean for the programs that are housed in those universities, uh, and and for the students that are left hanging. So his uh, his um, his uh, focus on the Indigenous Studies program is is a perfect example for a total lack of uh, consideration, both of the university's commitment to TRC and also of uh, um, academic integrity overall. And I just, can you, can I you, wonder if, I, sorry. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you could um, clear up that confusion uh, exa with yeah. exactly what's happening with the Indigenous Studies programs. Yeah, and I and frankly, we don't know. And so um, I've been asking around and talking to folks uh, who have more knowledge and experience with this than I do. And I have a colleague at uh, Nipissing University who's a new faculty member in our Indigenous Studies program. He's a Laurentian graduate, quite recent, um, and he's very connected with that community and with and with Laurentian. And I wonder he's he's allowed me to share his words. And I wonder if it's okay if I just quote a little bit. Um, from a from a from a conversation that we had, um, he said, "This is uh, sorry. This is Di Dr. Tyson Stewart, um, uh, who who works at Nipissing, as I said, and he said this decision um, terminates highly respected scholars who together oversaw one of the most important storied Indigenous studies departments in North America." Uh, and he says some have called it a blatant example of colonialism. And I think, you know, that really highlights that. Um, and and to be to be clear, no one actually really knows what the history, I mean, what the what the future for these faculty members are, because Laurentian doesn't have the power to terminate people at a federated university. However, I do know that at Many of the other at the other universities, such as Thornlow, which houses religious studies, people's contracts are just being canceled for teaching courses like across the board. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that that Tyson has said that he's heard is that, um, you know, kind of the writings on the wall, uh, things things th things are not looking good. And of course, Hashe's comment suggests as well. Uh, that there will be no Indigenous Studies program. There might be something vaguely called Indigenous Perspectives, but I think, you know, what my colleague um, Dr. Stewart uh, is wondering is, are those Indigenous uh, Perspectives going to be taught by Indigenous scholars, you know, people who are rooted in the community? And I think the other thing that he points out from uh, Hache's comment is, is his sort of dismissal of 140 students. It's only 140 students. You know, it's a small program. They'll be absorbed one way or the other. 
Um, and he says, um, it wasn't just a program like any other. It was a thriving community of Indigenous scholars, students, and locals. And so I think this really po points to the fact that universities are so embedded and responsible to their communities. You can't just restructure that as, as if it were a, a, an, you know, an auto manufacturer. We have about five minutes, and I want to get in a few more questions. But Nadia, I did see you nodding. <laughs> well, I, I just... I, I just want to point out his commitment to um, these students finding a pathway through Indigenous per courses with Indigenous perspective. That is different than a program of the Indigenous Studies program. The Indigenous Studies program here at Laurentian is one of the oldest. It was created by Indigenous scholars of the community for the community. So saying that they can continue to take courses through the Faculty of Arts, it's not the same. On Jillian's point about 140 students, it goes beyond the 140 students. At Laurentian, they have, to, in order to receive your degree, you need to have at least six credits in Indigenous studies or a course with Indigenous perspective. All of those students are affected as well. And so it affects the well-rounded education. And if I can bring it back just for a second to Alex Usher's points about relying on international students, I think it's disingenuous to say that Laurentian has chosen not to. That's not true. Mm -hmm. Have they been su successful? Not as successful as other universities. I'm not clear on why. It's not something I'm involved with, but however, focusing on lack of indig um, lack of international students takes us away from the issues, and the issues are the chronic underfunding of public education, the administration at Laurentian choosing to go through the CCAA process to restructure university, as opposed to respecting the collective agreement that has provisions um, in in there to restructure programs. Um, Sebastian, we've been talking about students, and uh, you are representing students. Um, uh, how does this uh, affect their year and their degrees? What's happened? Yeah, I think what's uh, most complicated is the fact that it really depends what program you were initially in, how far along in that degree you are. Um, because now we have students who had reached out and essentially told us that they had three exams within one day because they had to do that before their professors were going to um, essentially be fired three days after, right? So in terms of the immediate, it's a lot of anxiety. It's a lot of lack of focus and, and being able to understand what it is that uh, your next years in this degree are going to look like. And the thing that I also want to highlight and that a lot of students have been talking about is that this doesn't only affect the programs for students whose these are their majors. This really speaks to the plethora of the variety uh, and the diversity of courses that students are able to take, meaning that those elective courses from those departments, which prior would have been requirements for these students, are no longer going to be available, meaning that the diversity and the quality of the education that these students are receiving um, is essentially left aside and not considered, leaving students with even more anxiety about the future of their degrees or having to move and relocate to be able to finish those degrees themselves. There's a lot of anxiety, Nadia, because uh, for students, and also for the uh, faculty who have been laid off, it, there is a pandemic, you know, what are the prospects for you and other professors who have been laid off? Oh, wow. Um, it's, well, any one of us that want to continue in academia will have to leave Sudbury uh, because there is no other university. We do not know the fate of the federated universities. I know Thornlow and the U of S University of Sudbury are now challenging that decision. But if we want to continue on in academia, of course, we'd have to leave the city. And the same is true with students. Um, this, this idea that they can continue on at Laurentian, well, they can continue on, but not in their degree of choice. Um, these cuts have minimized their options at Laurentian and to study at home. Um, as well, it, it minimizes the choices for future students. So it does cut off pathways. Um, um, to education, uh, pathways to uh, careers, to live and work in your language, near your community. Um, so the impact is not just faculty. There will, be a, there will be a huge impact on students that go beyond this term. We have one more minute, uh, Gillian, and I'll give it to you, because one report estimates that up to uh, $100 million will be lost to Sudbury, the community itself. What does that mean for Sudbury and the Northern Ontario University community when students and faculty have to leave? 
Yeah, it's devastating for northern communities. Uh, you know, we at, in North Bay and in Sudbury, this university is the third largest employer in town. So when it lays off hundreds of people, um, it has a catastrophic effect for the economy, you know, mortgages, taxes, you name it, but also a, a profound effect on the social uh, impact on the community as well. I mean, this is a this is a huge brain drain from the north, as Nadia says, uh, people are going to have to leave, students are going to leave, um, and and that means a loss of community mem committed community members uh, who are involved in every part of uh, Sudbury's uh, life, and. Uh, and it will just leave the community poorer in every way. We really appreciate all of you making... Oh, Nadia, I'll give you 10 seconds. Yes, just to add to that, the programs that were cut have affected and will affect the community. Um, so Laurentian has been key in the regreening of Sudbury. The School of Environmental Studies is gone. Um, the midwifery program, the only bilingual midwifery program in Canada, the only midwifery program in the North that serviced the community in meaningful ways, that's gone. So it will have a huge impact on the community and the services that we're able to provide in the community. We all appreciate your time so much, um, and we will be thinking of you and the community there. Thank you so much for all your insights. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Two years ago, Ontario's New Democratic Party said... Black community members should see themselves represented and respected when they look at their government. Black Canadian leaders must be at the table when every decision is made. And with that, they created the first ever Black Caucus at Queen's Park. It's a milestone, but also underscores the relatively small number of black Ontarians who've been sent to the Pink Palace. With us now to reflect on their experiences and Unlike our regular custom, where we normally introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, I think protocol dictates this time that we go in order of experience, starting in Scarborough, Ontario, with Alvin Curling, who in 1985 became the first ever black cabinet minister in Ontario history. He's also a former speaker of the legislature. In Forest Hill, in the capital city, there is Anena Akande, who in 1990 became the first ever black female MPP and cabinet minister in Ontario history. And we also welcome two members of the current NDP caucus. In her riding of Kitchener Centre, Laura May Lindo. And in her riding of Toronto St. Paul's, Jill Andrew. They are both founding members of the NDP's Black Caucus, and we welcome all four of you to TVO tonight for, uh, I would suggest, an important and uh, perhaps a bit of a nostalgic discussion as well about uh, time at the Pink Palace. And as we start this, let's just put your part uh, political participation into some kind of perspective here. And with that, I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up this graphic because... You follow in the footsteps of a very important person. The first black Ontario MPP ever elected was in 1963. That was Leonard Austin Braithwaite, represented Etobicoke in the Ontario legislature. And it would, of course, be more than 20 years later before the first black Ontario cabinet minister was named. That was the aforementioned Alvin Curling in 1985. There's been a total of 14 MPPs elected to office who identify themselves as black. Only 14 since Confederation. And there are currently seven black members in the legislature today, five New Democrats, two liberals. All right, let's get into some background here. Many of you were asked, I, I think probably in some cases, numerous times to get into provincial politics. And I want to know, given how rare black political participation is at Queen's Park, I want to get a better understanding of what finally got you to yes. Alvin Curling, why did you finally say yes? Say yes. Uh, that's a very, that's a very direct question. The fact is that um, in 1985, when I was asked uh, to, to participate, I think that the Liberals were having quite a lot of challenge anyhow of getting anyone to run with this um, blue machine, uh, the incumbent being Tom Wells, to represent uh, Scarborough. You're referring and, to the um, fact that so the Conservatives when... had been in power for 42 straight years in 1985. That's right. For 42 years of, uh, of, of um, ruling as the conservative, what they call the blue machines with uh, Bill Davis, uh, Scarborough was known as the conservative bastion 
of 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 the of political in, uh, situation in, in the province, and um, so therefore, I, to get a, a liberal to run in that riding was quite challenging. And I was asked, as a matter of fact, let's give you a perspective of it all. There was, there was 410 um, polls in that riding, and 82, the liberal had won only one poll. So therefore. When I was asked, I presume they were seeking someone to do it, so forth. So I stepped forward and I, we ran for the nomination unopposed and got the nomination then. And of course, won on election day. Now let me take Zunaina Akande to 1990. The New Democrats had never won the riding that you contested in 1990. So what made you say yes? Well, I looked at the platform. I really, I had been asked before, but I looked at the platform and I, uh, to see whether in fact I was eager to go out and campaign for myself on those issues. I had campaigned for many other candidates in, in their election. And I saw three things that interested me and uh, that I was willing to speak to. Uh, Long-term care, because old women are poor women, um, stepping in and out of the workforce for various reasons. Uh, combined services for children, especially since uh, uh, black children and many other poor children were having difficulties with the school system and with uh, the kind of instruction they were receiving. And uh, then employment equity. And those three things influenced me, and I thought, these are issues that I can speak to, that I'm interested in, that I'm focused around, and I'm, I'm willing to go out and campaign for that. Hmm. Laura May Lindo, I'm going to ask you the same question, but put a little tweak on the end of it. And that tweak is, your uncle is Alvin Curling. So I'm wondering <laughs> how influential he was in your decision to run. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you for having this opportunity to be with Uncle Alvin today. Um, it never occurred to me that I couldn't win. Um, but politics was never something that I had thought about doing. I was actually asked by uh, MPP Catherine Fife in Waterloo, who met me when I mounted a summit into the status of race and racism on Canadian university campuses. And actually, Uncle Alvin uh, was kind enough to come out my way uh, to Waterloo Region and be part of the hosting of that summit. After it was done, it was actually Catherine Fife who pulled me aside and asked me a number of times if I would consider running. Um, and what got me to finally say yes, because I did say no repeatedly, uh, what got me to finally say yes was when she said to me, imagine if you had a broader platform to do the uh, racial justice work that you'd want to do in post-secondary. And at one point, I had to sit down with that and make a decision about whether or not I was going to walk the talk um, or just sort of stay within that one sphere that I was already in, uh, knowing that there would be limitations to how far that advocacy was. Gotcha. Catherine Fife, of course, being the current member for the NDP for Waterloo. Now, Jill Andrew, as I ask you the same question, we should point on, on the record, there has never been a person of color who represented St. Paul's in the past, and the NDP had also never won St. Paul's before you. So what got you to say yes? Well, first of all, I was asked, and I was asked a few times. Uh, but what got me to say yes, you know, having worked in education for several years, I had seen the disproportionate impact of racism, of discrimination, uh, felt by black youth, indigenous youth, you know, youth of color, queer youth, you know, and as I thought about it more and more and more, I realized that politics could be a platform for me to fight, you know, against anti-black racism, against homophobia and transphobia, and all the things that had plagued uh, so many students that I had worked with over the years. So for me, education was a very seminal reason uh, for why I said yes. And also even healthcare too. I had experienced uh, some pretty, you know, egregious experiences in healthcare, you know, and uh, for me, it was important to be at a table where I could help change policy, where I could help change minds, you know, and make, you know, our, our institutions more equitable inclu and inclusive uh, for, for black and, and racialized people across Ontario. Now, we're just actually a few days past the actual second anniversary of the creation of the Black Caucus by the New Democrats at Queen's Park. And Laura May, let me get you back in here on this. 
just give us, give us some better understanding of why you thought there would be value in the creation of a so-called black caucus in the NDP party at Queen's Park. What did you hope it could achieve? Um, so I think I have to answer that and take it a step back because it wasn't actually the NDP that decided to form the Black Caucus. It was that we had had a community meeting with black leaders. Um, Zanena Conde actually was with us uh, on that day. And a number of people at that table were shocked that there were that many black people in one party at that one time. And in that moment, a number of people kept saying, wow, it would be kind of neat if there was a Black Caucus. Wow, it would be really interesting to figure out how could you use this moment in history to do something to advance the needs and, and supports and advocacy for Black communities. Um, and I actually remember Zanane at the very end sort of whispering in my ear, it would be kind of cool to have a Black Caucus, wouldn't it? And so we brought <laughs> all of this up. We brought all of the information back to the leader of the official opposition, to Andrea Horvath. Um, and I remember Andrea pulling me aside at one point before the actual decision was made. And she said to me, I've over the years, I've done a lot of work with black communities. Um, there's always sort of steps and and. Uh, ideas that we have on ways to structure supports for them and rarely do they work in making real change. So I don't want to go this step unless there's a commitment that we're actually going to do the work. Hmm. And so for me, that became a moment where I thought, okay, the, the Black Caucus can actually do something real, then I too would like to, to be part of the formation of the Black Caucus. Yeah, let me so find out. Let, let me find out more about that from Zanena Akande. What what tangible things did you think the creation of a black caucus at Queen's Park could actually achieve? I thought that it would be a collective voice speaking to affect the changes that were necessary for our uh, communities. I remember way back when, when I was in government and I had to, I was determined to get employment equity passed. I had to go and solicit among those within my party, none of whom were black, to get support of nine people uh, to focus our whole attention on getting the caucus to support us in bringing that, uh, that to the table. It was not easy. And um, because I was one voice, uh, um, actually two, because Gary Malkowski was there too, uh, speaking to encourage all the others, even though we were the majority at that time. And so I thought how much easier that would be to have a group, a black caucus to uh, help to move the, the, the whole agenda along. And also to look at each issue from our point of view to see, in fact, if we were omitted uh, almost without having been considered. Uh, that would be extremely important, and I'm sure they'll do it. Gary Mel Melkowski, if I recall, was the first ever deaf MPP uh, in the That's Ontario right. legislature and had somebody on the floor with him uh, who would sign his questions and answers during question period. Alvin Curling, I'd like your view on uh, the creation of this Black Caucus and whether you think it's a good idea. Well, let's say this. Um, let me take the, some of the glory out of uh, uh, Laura May. Uh, when Zanina Kandy was there and doing her pro project, we had a black caucus. They named Alvin Curling and Zanina Kandy. Well, we didn't meet. Uh, it, 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 we met in mind. And it was kind of, as Zanina remember, putting our bills through, how strategic it was. And I wasn't even the critic, but I was asked to respond to, to some of the issues that's of the day. And it was sort of rather skillful. And I want to say, let me commend Zanina Kandi for this, because I want to be forceful in a certain political way, but it wasn't working politically. But it was more as a social conscious move we have to make. And um, so when this is formed, um, I said, well, here we go. It doesn't matter. Just like you asked the question before, but as long as we are uh, able to focus on the issue, it doesn't matter what party it was. So I was delighted to hear that. All right, let me follow up with Jill Andrew on that. The idea of creating the Black Caucus, we have some understanding of that right now, but let's find out when the rubber actually hit the road, what you think it's been able to achieve over the past two years. 
Thank you, Steve. You know, I certainly think that we have worked hard to continue building trust in Black communities across Ontario, and that we have done that through several consultations on key issues uh, impacting our community, everything from arts and culture to education to jobs and employment to the justice system, uh, quote unquote, to the health care system, to housing. Uh, we have spoken you know, with, with Black Ontarians to get their voice and to hear their voice and to have that considered in every piece of legislation that we have certainly, as NDP, uh, put forth. Something else that we achieved that is very, very near and dear to my heart is we have brought hundreds of Black youth, of racialized youth, to Queen's Park to literally walk in that building and to take stock of who's on the walls and who's not on the walls, who's in the seats and who's not in the seats, so they can recognize that Queen's Park is their house and that they too can one day be elected officials and create change in their community. Well, because he was a speaker of the legislature, there is a portrait of Alvin Curling at Queen's Park. So he's one of yes, the guys on the walls. And yes, I do want to yes. pick up with Alvin Curling here because... Mr. Curling, you may not remember this, but I remember it very well. Uh, more than 20 years ago, you and I had a conversation for, I think, the first book I ever wrote, at which time you told me that for probably the first six months that you showed up to work at Queen's Park every day when you were first elected in 1985, you had an absolutely blasting headache because you felt so much pressure as the first ever black cabinet minister not to let down the side. And I wonder if you could just sort of go into that a little bit right now and tell us why you felt so much pressure not to disappoint. Well, Mayor, thank you very much, Steve, for that question. It's a very intriguing question because the fact is that representation, uh, that the black community was so delighted that a black was there, but also the Chinese and the, the First Nation, the Indians, Asian people, saw me as their individual who represent their cause. So I had to almost try to represent all those groups. And I was the only one. And the pressure was, how much time can I put into this, this situation? And not only within this, the, the situation of Scarborough North or Scarborough Roots River at the time. The fact is that we had uh, people from all over, from Windsor, whatever, who were seeing me to come to their uh, functions and uh, their issues. And the demand was extremely difficult uh, because I was representing, let's say, Ontario, so to speak. I was going to Sudbury all over the place. And Zanina can identify with that in 87 too. She was called beyond that. So the challenges and the headaches were there. And I hope I do not let them down. I hope that uh, I can articulate their issues and I, and, I, and I seek their help in this regard. And I want to say to you that it is those individuals out there who advances those issues and were kind enough, I would say kind enough, to be patient for as I put forward these issues itself and hope that the party, regardless of who it was, accept some of the concerns that we had and acted upon them. And Zanina Akande, I'll ask you the follow-up question, which is when you got elected in 1990 and you walked into the legislature, there was you and there was Alvin Curling, and that was it. There was 128 other members in there who didn't look like you. That's what was right. that like? Well, it's it's like living in Toronto. Remember, I was raised here, and so I'm accustomed to being, um, you know, in in uh, an other majority population, and it was like that. But there were all eyes on on on, on us. I remember I uh, gave the high sign to uh, Alvin, and uh, it was like everybody looked. Um, they asked very strange questions. Um, some of them, in trying to be friendly, were absolutely hysterical, uh, if not obnoxious. Uh, I Go was ahead, give us an example. I, I was asked, for example, if I bought that suit instead of a car because of the way I dressed, or why I was uh, driving a, uh, a certain kind of car. I won't, uh, I won't give uh, Volvo the big, the big introduction. 
<laughs> which which was standardized. I mean, I mean, it's things that had absolutely nothing to do with politics, and um, I, I was rather disappointed because I thought, now here I'm going to be sitting with people who are really focused on the issues that affect our lives, uh, the finance, the education, the social services. I was excited and I was prepared. I read, I read, I read everything that I could read. And yet the conversation was quite different from that. And I realized that, uh, well, all the intelligence isn't existing in this room. <laughs> uh, Lorme Lindo, that was, we should point out, <laughs> three decades ago. And I think the assumption today is that things are better in our provincial seat of government today. Are they? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I think things are different. Uh, we've had the rise of Black Lives Matter, um, you know, solidarity marches all across the province, which means that there was broader attention to the kinds of issues impacting Black communities when I was elected and when Jill was elected. Um, there's been a shift in the kinds of debates, the kinds of conversations that are happening in the chamber. I've had veteran members that have come up to me um, and said that they have never had uh, this level of extensive discussion about black communities in everything that they're doing. And part of that is a nod to the work that we're doing in the Black Caucus, the fact that it doesn't matter what they're talking about, black folks are impacted. Um, mm -hmm. And that goes back to something that Zanana was saying. And so we've made sure that um, we've been keeping an eye on every piece of legislation, the impact that it has on black communities mm -hmm. and the, the different impact, like it's a different impact in Waterloo region, black community members in my area versus black community in Toronto or black folks that are far north. Um, and this has become part of our everyday conversation, which is shifting the, the discourse. So that's different. Um, but there's still, I'm still shocked by the stat that you had at the very beginning of this, you know, 14 mm -hmm. people. So that, that has not changed significantly, and that's something that we have to focus on and, and actually put a concerted effort into changing it. But that doesn't happen unless you value the voices that are at the table um, in every given session. Yeah, Jill Andrew, maybe you can follow up on that with this. 14 MPPs in the last 150, whatever it is, uh, four years, almost since Canada uh, became a country, I mean, that's shockingly few. Do you have any theories as to why there have been so few black MPPs at Queen's Park? You know, I will say this, Steve. If legislation does not speak to the lives of the people it's supposed to support, people grow very wary of trusting politicians. They grow very wary of the democratic process. So what we need to see in Ontario government is legislation that actually speaks to and cares about and hopes to better the lives of those who have been most marginalized from participating. And, you know, our black communities, indigenous communities, racialized communities, you know, we have had a historical, uh, you know, lack of participation. And not because we do not want to participate, but I would argue because we do not see a place for ourselves in politics. We have to be very, very careful with regards to legislation and its impact it has on black lives. You know, for instance, as you know, here in Ontario, uh, we have a premier who is not supportive of paid sick days and has refused our calls as NDP for paid sick days at every turn. That piece of legislation, refusing that piece of legislation is a manifestation of, of black racism, of anti-black racism. Because when we look at the stats and we see who the essential workers are, we see who is dying of COVID-19, we see the areas in our communities that are most impacted, it is overwhelmingly racialized. Overwhelmingly, we see Black people there. So what does it say about progress when we have a premier who refuses to support Black lives in this very tangible way in 2021? when we're dealing with an unprecedented pandemic. You know, so how do we get more black people? How do we get more racialized people into politics? By allowing them to see that there's a space there for them, that politicians actually care, and that they don't just care six months before the election, you know? I hear what you're saying. On the other hand, we have no Tories on this panel who, who might refute what you just said. So let me just, uh, you know, play devil's advocate here and say, 
you know, I'm sure the conservatives just do not interpret what you said. They, they look at the same facts you just advanced and they do not interpret it the same way. They may have their other reasons for not wanting to put sick, sick days in, but certainly racism would not be one of the explanations they would give. Do you accept that? No. No, I don't. No, no I don't. Absolutely not. Um, no. What I accept is we have a government that has routinely, routinely erased and ignored the voices and the expertise that black members of our community, frontline health care workers, doctors, medical experts have shared over and over again about what needs to be done to support our communities during this pandemic, you know, and, and, and that's cost lives. Hmm. So now it's, it's time to do what's right. It's time to listen to our communities. And that means listening to black people. All right. Well, let's try this then. I, um, Zanina Akande, I think I remember this well enough that, that the, uh, the legislative session when you got elected was 1990 to 95. And you left in 94, which meant you left right. a year before you had to, which meant Absolutely. there was something going down that you weren't happy with. So my question is, if you had to recommend to perhaps members of the black communities around Ontario right now, whether to or whether not to get into public life based on your own experience, where you left early, would you recommend they do it? I would recommend that some do it. I would recommend that uh, those who feel that they have the persuasive abilities, the, um, the, the uh, skills to talk to their colleagues and to encourage their interests in er areas of, of not only racism, but also uh, concerns about poverty, uh, which also puts us into the picture. I, I, would, I would suggest that those people go into politics. I would suggest, though, so, that the others be supportive, be vocal, be consistent, demand outside. I remember when uh, we were in government and we, uh, we, I was determined to have this employment equity passed, and uh, some of my colleagues were not happy, I tell you, when we brought it to the floor because they thought that would be the basis of their, their losing the next election, although there were many other things. But uh, I remember thinking to myself, uh, and saying to my people outside, to blacks outside, you want this legislation, open your mouths and continue to say so. Phone your representatives. Make sure that any time you have an opportunity to talk about it, talk about why you need it, because we need both groups. And the reason I left is that is 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 tied very much to what Jill is saying, but differently. I um, was uh, you know accused of of overcharging for my duplex, a rent review. And so I told the premier at that time that I was going as soon as we got employment equity so that <laughs> I could be certain that my children walked with their heads in the air and not with a question that was left for two years. So just before I left, guess what? They decided that I had not overcharged. Hmm. They put that on page 52 while they put the accusation on page one. Uh, That's uh, uh, why I left. I'm sad to say you're not the first person that's happened to and you won't be the last. That is a shame. Yeah, that's true. That's Alvin, true. Alvin Curling, let me get back to that original question. Would you recommend public life for people in the black communities around this province, given your own experience with it? I would recommend it, but I'd also say don't tie yourself into party politics because the issues get lost because uh, if right. you a party politics, blacks should be involved with the issues, regardless of the NDP, conservative or liberals. Because when they tie themselves into it, and Zadina expressed it very well, all of a sudden their policies itself overrule the interests of what the black people want. And therefore you say, well, the party doesn't need this. And I always see a party uh, as, a, as, a, as a club. If, you're, if you don't follow the rules, that's it. So therefore, I would say to black people, you have a strong uh, responsibility in which to join up whatever party you do and, and advance the issues that you want and don't lose track of that. 
So therefore, we have a full responsibility on the black community itself to get involved and not only to be elected, but Lord, to be a part of the political process. Understood. Laura, Laura May Lindo. Just make one comment, yeah, sure, one go ahead. Comment, I noticed that, um, and maybe not by accident, maybe by, I don't know what it is, that all four people who are on this panel today are from the academic institutions. I was at Seneca <laughs> earlier, and, it's, yeah. right, they're that. and they're black. Therefore, it's telling you something there that they, that yeah. hero would need to be addressed fully. And I don't know, we could maybe look into that one of these days. Why is it this so? That these are people who are all academics. <laughs> that is a fascinating observation. I had not realized that. Well, let me give the last word here to uh, Laura May Lindo. And uh, I guess we should note that you and Jill Andrew have both decided to run again uh, in the 2022 election. So mm -hmm. um, I, I, I ask you to address the same question. Do you feel, based on the uh, nearly three years that you've had at Queen's Park already, do you feel this is a place where black voices are heard and respected and have a place? Um, it has to be. Like, it, that's, it can't be a question as to whether or not we have a space there. This is literally the, the space that creates legislation that tells us what is valued and how which social systems are going to support us if things happen, like a pandemic. Um, it's the place that determines how we are going to live the best quality lives ever. Um, so we have to have a place. We have to demand that place. We have to take that space. But I think that um, it does. the question does remind me of something that Uncle Alvin had said to me uh, when I was trying to decide who I was going to run for. So I had a couple different people asking me. I had made a decision that I was going to run. Um, I went over to Uncle Alvin's house. I said to him that the NDP had given me a, a very clear, like, please run for us kind of ask. And I wanted him to still love me because he is liberal and he is my uncle. <laughs> And uh, so I went and I had to sit down with him and I will never forget what he said. He said, remember that every single political party wants the best Ontario that they can build, but they have different tools to get there. So choose your tools. Hmm. And so I took that back and thought to myself, well, I like the way that the NDP talks very openly, very clearly, very definitively about addressing uh, anti-Black racism, um, that they are willing to use an intersectional lens when they're talking about housing or when they're talking about older adults or when they're talking about employment and education. And that's, that's where I'm rooted. That's where my academic life has been. And so those are the tools that allow me to do work to make sure that all of our communities are better. And so for me, that's why that party was chosen. But it does circle back to the idea that we need to make sure that black people that are focused on supporting black communities um, are in every party because of the nature of our system, because we have to be at the, at the table. And I think we need to demand that space. I want to thank you for for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views so candidly with us. Alvin Curling and Zanina Akande from back in the day, two pioneers to be sure, and Laura May Lindo and Jill Andrew, who are trying to do pioneering of their own kind today. And, uh, you know, it's kind of funny. I know back in the day I used to call him Minister Alvin or I'd call him Speaker Alvin or I'd call him Ambassador Alvin. I never called him Uncle Alvin. Maybe I should try that going forward. <laughs> anyway, thank you, you four. This was a joy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. And that is the agenda for Monday, April 19th, 2021. Tomorrow, we'll hear about the economic fallout for women on the front lines of this pandemic. Also, with the federal budget now unveiled, we'll open up the child care file. Hope you'll join us for that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you.